Pediatric Lounge, a podcast taking you behind the door of the Physician's Lounge to get a deeper insight into just what docs are talking about today. From the clinically profound to the wonderfully routine and everything in between. Good morning, George. It's Tuesday morning and we're back at the podcast again. Yep, we are. Um, today, we have another one of those great physicians that I've known for a very long time, Dr. Marjorie Surkoff. Um, She's going to talk to us today about, what are you going to talk about today, Marjorie? Well, I'd like to talk about uh, the importance of primary care, what's going on right now, what, uh, what things out in the medical community are, are impacting and concerns about how we support the importance of primary care, because I think it's, it's, it's falling by the wayside. All right, Herb, take it away. Well, welcome, uh, Dr. Sertov. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Thank you. Um, you have a long and stellar career, but we always um, like to know, why did you become a pediatrician? So it was funny. So I went to De- SUNY Downstate, and um, and medical school certainly was uh, interesting <laughs> with everything coming at you. And and so I had gone through third year. I had gone through different um, uh, specialties: internal medicine, surgery, OB, which I actually thought I might be interested in. And then when I got to pediatrics, uh, I did it at uh, um, uh, Methodist Hospital in Brooklyn. And I had a, a, a doc, a preceptor, a Dr. Tajani, who actually was a pediatric nephrologist. And on one of our uh, rounds, he talked about how um, um, prevention is so important. And he, would, he used an example of, you could be a butcher and make a diagnosis of appendicitis when it's ruptured, but a physician will make the diagnosis before it's a problem. And that was actually one of the first times in my in the year that the emphasis was on prevention and and helping uh, keeping things in a place where you don't end up with potential tragedies. And I was like, uh, this is for me. And that's that from there on, I knew that that's where I wanted to go. Yeah, wow. actually, you know what? The, I forgot to mention her actual topic is called Hospitals and Corporations Promise Doctors the World. And then they destroy the essence of what made private practice great in the first place. Yes, yes. That was the title. Yes. Okay. So, um, what what is the importance of primary care? I, I would say early diagnosis and preventive care. Yes. So, I think you know that that uh, term medical home is really very very important. And, and, and I think sometimes it gets tossed aside because I think what we can do in primary care is we actually have a very good understanding of fa- the families. You treat, we treat kids, but it's within the context of a, of a family. And, 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 and so your, your ability to communicate with people on a regular basis, your ability to get a really deep understanding of the the family, the and in our instance, children, and I think that first of all leads to a lot of trust. It leads to great communication, which is so critical for good care. And it, at the end of the day, I think we're we're very cost effective because if we can do those things that we're, I think are so important uh, to primary care, we we really can. Uh, practice in a cost-effective way, and and most important is give give um, excellent care and quality care for families. Um, so it gets back to what we talk about all the time: her relationships. Yes, That's right. Yeah, and, and why and, is this best done in a private practice, an independently owned practice that is led and owned by physicians? So it's it's really interesting because I think I, I think the situation of what's going on right now is um, the question is is can you run your own practice? How do you run your own practice? Are the other possibilities out there um, <clears throat> um, uh, are they more likely to make make it successful? But I think on a lot of levels, you know, 
what's important in an outpatient primary care setting is different from what's required in a, in a hospital setting or, or another type of setting, because you need certain, you need a structure in that, to, so that your first of all, quality is always number one, but access, availability, um, continuity, um, those things, again, are so important to the relationships that you develop. And, and, and while it's, it's not easy, it takes a lot of, especially, you know, with physicians, we tend to be very independent, my way or the highway. But I think if you can find collaborations with others that, that you, you know, you, you can disagree, but you come to some consensus and it's always for the well-being of the patient, it, it, it really leads to an incredible, incredible thing, it, incredible thing for your life, for your families, um, just for your finances, it, it, it really is a very rewarding thing. And I, I don't think at this point, I think the, the primary care needs to be private based on some of the experiences I've gone through. Um, it's, it's, and why don't you tell us, Marjorie, Herb doesn't know, why don't you tell us about your experiences, where you were and where you are and what so, happened in I mean, We got a long, yeah, got a long, trip. long, long time, yeah. So, so I was with a, 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 a practice and we sort of came together a couple of different pieces. So this is one, uh, some came from one group, some came from another group and we came together in 90, what was it, 91. And so there were six, to, six of us to start. And because we were able, we all, and the, one of the things that was important is we respected each other. For, mm -hmm. for who we were or how we, how we practiced as physicians. Um, again, turn, certainly different personalities. You know, I'm Italian, who was with this, whatever. Anyway, yeah. um, but we were able to come together and, you know, we took some risks when we first decided, yeah, we're going to do this. And uh, we were able to build a very successful um, pediatric uh, practice. With at one point we had, I think it was 16 providers. At one point we had three offices. We went on down to two, which I think was again, we made some mistakes along the way. And it was a it was a really good collaboration. And over time we would look at, okay, people are going to urgent care, so we need to extend hours. We were there seven days a week from the get-go. We we had an incredible staff that worked with us uh, and uh, reception, nursing. Uh, and again, we delegated so that we could practice medicine. And it was it was very successful for, what was it, 20, about 25 years. And then of course, things come along and, and, and uh, you're, there's offers and you look at the whole picture, people's health and age. And so we ended up deciding to, to go with a, 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 a you know, larger setting. Uh, I don't know what word I can use, but system. it was a system. A system. A system. It was a system, and um, and 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 uh, we had done a lot of research in terms of what was out there, and always the, our primary thing was always the integrity of the system we 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 wanted to join, and I think integrity was there. But as it turned, and we had certain, again, the structure, we had an incredible EMR, we had incredible uh, uh, reception, uh, not re only reception, our, our, uh, our uh, ancillary staff. And there were certain things, and, and we were also very involved in the data. I, I, I kept the, I was in charge of looking at numbers and, and how, the, how things were flowing and overhead. And there were certain things I knew were important in order to make the place function well. And I thought we could continue that. But unfortunately, uh, because again, the systems sometimes are so overwhelmingly large that you may not be the priority. And so you sort of get lost in the shuffle. Yeah, and pediatrics is never the priority for systems. No, you're right. Nobody cares. You're right. You're yeah. absolutely correct. And it, it's still ongoing, uh, but um, but so, that I'm going to interrupt you for a second because yeah. I think um, I, I do think that there are some administrators that actually have a soul. Um, <laughs> I, no, I think to. no, no. I think and, I don't think and they, they and they do. I mean, especially if they're doctors or nurses, 
and then they become administrators. Yes. Um, the problem is that they do bump up against the wall at, at some point, and we're seeing this in a lot of our community hospitals here, where they are no longer able to keep staff or proficiency like in the inpatient wards in the community hospitals. There's mm -hmm. just not that many kids that get admitted. Yeah. And it's not even a question of can we make money or can we give it as a service? It's we get one kid a week. We can't even find competent nurses to staff yes. the unit. It yes. starts to become a danger to the kid to do it. Yes. And they start dropping these lines because they don't have competency. They don't do it often enough. Sure. And I think they see, they don't understand the pediatric office. Correct. I don't think they, they understand primary care. In, no. In, including uh, family medicine, adult medicine. Again, as, as, as George said, the, the relationships and the communication, it, it gets, it's gotten lost. Yes, because the system is very transactional, right? I, I break my hip, I go in, the, the surgeon, you know, yeah. comes in, drills it, puts it back together. They set me up with, you know, rehab. I'm out the door. There's mm -hmm. a transaction. Yep. Um, well, yep. primary care is the long game. We're going to yeah. be here for 18 years in pediatrics. Some, you know, family practices, you know, they take a 25 year old, that 25 year old is going to outlive the, the, the physician, right? <laughs> it's true. I mean, if, oh I took a, <laughs> if I took a 25 year old patient today, I'm, I'm going to Oh yeah, no, 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 you're right. No, no, but no. I, right. I will Understand. be, I will be gone yes. way before that person right. turns 60 years old. I mean, that's 40 yes. years into the future. Yes, yes, um, yes. And I don't think they can manage that. They're not, not, they're not in the relationship management business. No, no. They're in the transaction business. Well, I think even with, with use of hospitalists, and again, you know, not having to go to the hospital, as you know, you're like, oh, okay. But that loses that, that communication. Even like we were, we were making rounds at one of the local hospitals till uh, a couple of years ago. And then we were told, okay, now so this is taking a hospitalist are taking over, and and families were were upset because they 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 would you know when they when they would come to you they when they were older they go oh you saw them as soon as they were born and stuff and that was that was a, again that was another connection that you made so it's it's a, and again I don't know that I think that horse is uh, is out of the barn, but it's a component of what's occurred because this one takes care of this, this one takes care of that. And what pediatrics and primary care does is we pull everything together. We coordinate. And if you do that properly, again, you're optimizing care, you're cost effective, you cut to the chase of what needs to be done. And 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 the bottom line is you 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 contribute to the well-being of those you take care of. Right. And and so it seems that what you're trying to tell me is that when you ran your own private practice, you had a culture that was focused on quality and access, ability, and affability to your patients that right. built good relationships. And the thing was, the structure was critical. And I, I can't emphasize, because again, what, what do, I don't mean to interrupt, but what are the things that you utilized and how did you do it to, to make sure your patients had availability? So for example, when we had the, the whatever system we had, we, we had our phones answered within 30 to 60 seconds on average. And we had a, we had a large practice. Um, moving forward, as we went into a system, because again, change, because this has to be used versus that, it ended up being six minutes per phone call at times. Uh -oh. So how does that help? How does that help care? It doesn't. And it no. leads to frustration. You know, that I always looked at this as okay, even like, even how do you finances? How do you how do you set it up? So you optimize again, always care. I always said you didn't have to compromise care, you could still financially do, you know, have a solid place. But there were certain structures that needed to be there, and those actually were were tossed. <laughs> so oh. let me ask you: when when you were when you were in private practice, somebody in your office answered your phones. 
Oh, we yes, we had we because when you switched over to the system, did they have a one one huge call center for everybody? No, we, no, no, we continued. We tr we kept stuff in house, but okay. based on well, you know, I'm sure you guys EMR electronic health records. Which one are you using? Some are very and that's the some are very user friendly, I believe, for primary care. And others, not really. And and I think when you look at, for example, PEDS, we, you do volume. You do volume, you need access. So you need something where a family, you know, mom's in the morning getting ready to go to work and the kids set up, needs to get on. This is what I need. Make the appointment go. It's not that they've got 10 or 15 minutes because they've got two or three kids to take care of. Again, it's that, you know, what else is going along with the phone call? <laughs> Right. The kids having so, breakfast. Somebody's yelling about something. It's it. So it's, when you when you switch the phone systems to the to the corporate systems, then you got this huge delay. Yes. It, was, it wasn't the people or no 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 the we, process. We have, it was just a phone system. Right. Messed everything up. And it's sad because it it, it was discussed. You know, again, being in being in the the practice, and again the 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 group was you know the the managing partners were very involved in overseeing and watching making sure as well as having a, a, a staff that was really uh, what's the word um dedicated to the to the families so that was all you know that was all in place but if you're not listened to and you're giving data and you give even as far as numbers and finances and you figure, okay, a system is interested in making money, right? But so you give data, you give information and it's significant information and you're not listened to because, you know, it's again, it's a big system. Yeah, these differences, whatever they may be, you know, phone or ideas and things, how did that affect patient care? I, I do believe there was uh, there was frustration on the on the part of of families. Um, you know, people would come in and said it's not like it it used to be. Although again, you know, people you know people come for who they see. They see Dr. Rogu. They love Dr. Rogu, so they're going to put up with the nonsense. Uh, but but it's frustrating to them. Um, and then sometimes it gets to the point where they you know they they've had it. And and you know what? It, to me, it's unnecessary because it's like, come on, we want to build this thing. You know, that's what when we were the what, what we were, we were always like, okay, now what? Now what do we get into? <laughs> Sometimes it was like too much. It was like, all right, we probably shouldn't have done that. But again, it was a, it was the collaboration, and it's just sad because the stuff isn't anything. Um, it's not rocket it's nothing, science, huh? It's not rocket science. It's not rocket science, and it's not like extreme. All it is is how do you how do you keep the communication good? And again, basic, basically based on who you're taking care of, what it's involved with, what's the population, and it was it was just like it was frustrating. It was sad. It was very sad. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't wait six minutes on the phone. I don't care how much I like the physician. No, uh, I would just find someone that can answer my phone and make my appointment. And the, the, the darn thing, it was unnecessary. Yeah. And when you join the, the big system, whether it's a hospital system or a private mm -hmm. equity, um, what do they promise you? I mean, they must've promised you a lot that you thought was going to make it better to see your patients. Well, it was funny because we, again, we were very successful. We were like at the 95th percentile on a lot of parameters. And so they, there was, there was, there were, you know, very positive things. And you think, okay, again, I go back to the, you know, I'm looking at, I looked at this from a business perspective. I'm thinking, all right, we got a great business. You, whoever we would network with would want to know about what made our business so good and so positive for all those years. 
And so you think, okay, and 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 we had I had I had done a lot of research on other uh, systems at that time who were because they were a lot of people interested in our group, um, and and I was just and I, actually it's funny I have a, a son who's in who's been with uh, corporate America on various things and he had discussed some stuff with me in terms of protocols and stuff but I was I'm an optimist. So I was like, oh, we could, you know, giving data, giving information, presenting data. It's a business. To me, again, it's a business. So business looks at certain things. <laughs> so what did they promise you? I mean, did they promise things wouldn't change, that they, they would help you grow the practice, help you yes, recruit yes. more physicians? For the practice, uh, you know, good uh, new office. Uh, um, um, EMR, we, we, we were, you know, we loved our, we had a certain EMR that was just so user-friendly for peds. And again, me being an optimist, and again, what happened with our group is time was going on. Someone had passed away a few years before, then somebody actually suddenly passed away right at the time of the transactions. So at, at that point, I was sort of sort of alone with some of the stuff that was going on still you know the the group was still working um so but but again I felt like we could we could make it work because over the years I found in life if you hit a if you hit a wall you backpedal figure out and see which other way you can go and and I thought because of what we the way we you know are set up it would be acknowledged and sort of utilized, but again, when you're in when you're in a big system, the system's got so many other things they're looking at, and and if it's a system based, not based in primary care, which again you you sort of learn you you sort of I I personally felt like I was you know you were sort of pushed to the side because it didn't comport with the, what the system required. Right. Which again, you yeah. know, that's, that's what the system needs. But yeah. what primary care needs is, is, um, you know, again, structure to to enhance availability and care and communication, and yeah. especially with pediatrics. Yeah, from what, from what I gather from discussing with you, I think you told me that you didn't have new next generation people to come into the leadership roles in the organization. Correct. And we, you know, one of the things, again, you know, everybody sets up their structure the way they think in, again, with, you know, it's with, with doctors, you're all like, well, let's do this. Let's do that. Let's do that. So you, you have to be able to collaborate and, and the way it had been set up, the collaboration between the originals was so strong that, and there were again, there were other people that that we, we could have could have been involved, but people didn't seem to want to be. Even when we joined the Northwell, oh, joined the just can that. Even when we joined the the system, um, it just it just didn't um, it it just just because that last time before we were joining, there was a lot of stuff that I was taking care of. Like for example, we lost. I think we lost about four practitioners, uh, four docs providers at that time. So I had to worry about, okay, how, how many do we have working? Where am I going to find new providers? There was a lot of, you know, there were definitely a lot of moving parts that, that lit. That oh. year. So, so, and, um, and, you know, if people come to you and say, can I help you? What do you want me to do? But if nobody comes to you, so you just have to take, you still have to take care of it yourself because it's your, your yeah. priority. Yeah. I don't think that you guys needed a system to help grow the practice because you guys were the largest group in Suffolk County. Yes. Private. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, we, I think you, we, guys, we, you guys had a big Titanic and the Titanic was crashing and you didn't have first mates to help yeah. steer it back. Yeah, it was, you know, in retrospect, it, um, see, and again, if I was, if I'd been 20 years younger, when all this was starting, there's no way I would have, I would have gone, but you get, yeah. and we had, you know, when we, with our business, we had gone through some things over the years, we did 
um, have, we did different things that at the end probably weren't the best idea. And again, we, we came together, we figured it out, we moved forward, but as you get, you get on in your life, some, sometimes you're just like, uh, oh. <laughs> you know, you get nervous. Let's, let's face it. Yeah. Yeah, you as you get older, you you you're um, less willing to take risk. Yes, you have less time to back off from that wall and Correct. figure it out and walk around. Correct. And when you hit the wall, it takes weeks to recover. Yeah, well, years. Yeah, we had a one of the two things over the years, and again, you know, because we collaborated with each other and we trusted each other. Because at times it was like somebody would say, okay, we're going to do this, this, and this. It's okay, that's cool. Then somebody else would say, okay, this, this is how we're going to approach it. And it'd be, all right, that's cool. And and it worked. You know, it, it worked. And then you get, you get older, who's who getting sick, who may be retiring. It's, it's, it's um, yeah, you know, the, life is your biz, business, but it also comes along with a family and all that stuff. <laughs> And so do you feel like um, this, you know, this huge enterprise eroded your relationship with your own patients? No, no, because my, they were always my priority. Okay. So I, you could, I, I did not, you, no. I, I, you could I, maintain I, their relationship with your patients. Yes, I would, well, I would not allow that. It, you okay. know, I always, my thing was I took a Hippocratic oath. And they were my priorities. So I don't care what was said. They were well, what about the other doctors around? I don't know. I don't do know. You... I can't I can't comment. No, you know what? I can't comment on them. Okay. I I yeah. I I come from a well, you know, when you when you're in this a long time, it's it's like who 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 and I that's why I think we were so successful because we all really it was our patients were our priority. Um, again, I couldn't change the phone systems after we joined, but when I, when I had my families I, that I was talking to, we still had a good communication and, uh, but I wouldn't let anything interfere with that. Did they mandate your hours or, you know, like, it's like, you're not working on Saturdays or. No, we were, you know, my thing was, you know, we're, we're all in this. So we took weekends, we took call, the, the managing partners. Some of the, again, what, what ended up happening was as, as we went on, the, I was probably, I was the only uh, initial uh, man uh, Found who, who stayed full time. Cause I, cause I felt like it was important. So where did, we didn't even ask for that. Actually it was funny because what made us successful was the hours available for our families. And I felt that was very important to continue. And I, I actually got pushback from others about they want, they didn't want to work on Sunday or um, they want to cut hours or they didn't want to see this or that. And I was like, well, we're here for the patients. It, it was, it was, it was, uh, interesting again, you know, uh, it, it's, um, I feel like it's, you know, it's part I'm in medicine 43 years now. I've been in practice since, um, 19, was it 1984? So I, and I always, I was very blessed to work with older doctors now I'm the older doctor, <laughs> but I, 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 and so you saw their, you know, how they approach things, their dedication, you know, the, and, uh, and so that's the, that's the, that's how, you know, we, we did it, right. but, uh, but, you know, it gets to a point where you, you try to preserve certain things and at some point you realize you're not going to be able to do it. It's just, right. The ship has sailed. Wow. And it, and it's sailed. Sad you know, Very sad. You guys were huge. Yeah. Well, I always felt my one of my hopes was, you know, because you get older, how are you going to preserve that thing you built? It was almost like a baby. I used, oh, to, yeah. call it, I used yeah. to call it my baby. And I felt like, okay, this is a way to preserve the baby and, and nurture and have it maintain and continue to grow. Yeah. But it didn't happen, yeah. you know, so that's, 
I think the secret sauce to a private practice is you have to have leadership or managing physicians or partners every 10 years. You need a new one. Yeah, if, I think if you're, you're, too right. top heavy, yeah. you're finished. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely agree with you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, um, it was, um, and, and again, that has to do with, we weren't, we weren't like, I, I, I was working this year with someone who was very much controlling everything and you can't do that. So George, you're absolutely correct. You right. need to be able to bring in others into the, into the mix and, and understand so that they can absolutely. So how do we do that? How do we get young medical students and pediatric residents to understand that just seeing the patient isn't enough? Huh. Good question. <laughs> yes, good question. So I think it's um, incumbent upon us, right? Yes. The older generation of physicians, and I, I say that word kindly, but um, but you're right, our, our mentors probably weren't great examples because they work 70, 80 hours a week. And, you know, that's all they did. Yeah. Uh, we probably are a little better. We don't work 80 hours a week. Yeah. We have families and hobbies and friends. Um, but I do think that we need to get young medical students and residents involved in teaching them how to manage a business and how to how to set a vision, how to um, take care of the patient. Because if, if your office closes, that patient doesn't get care. So right. it's not one or the other, it's both. Um, we do have a coaching group and we give a scholarship to one medical student so that they can learn, one, that private practice is the best practice for pediatrics and what they need to watch out for and so that they have that spark in them. So when they want, you know, do join the practice, they'll want to be involved in the management. Um, I don't see any other way out. We need to teach them because the academic centers are not going to teach them. No, they're, they're purposely not teaching them. They're purposely saying that you should not go into private practice. I, I have medical students from um, NYIT.com. Um, they come to me. Um, you'll see Marjorie in our office when you know, they'll be bouncing all over the place. Yep. They leave the rotation and they said, I never thought that pediatric private practice could be like this. I might change yeah. my future. Now, I don't know if they're telling me a story, but they keep saying it over and over again, all of them, not just my students, the other students that go with the other physicians. Yeah, yeah. So I don't yeah. know, I have, to, I have to teach the youngers because they're not being taught. Well, because you, you, your approach is it's the patient. You're right. there for the patient. And that's the joy of medicine. You know, helping figure out what's going on, discussing, preventing, uh, no scripts. It's a personal, because I always said to patients, there's like, even with treatment and stuff, I go, there's evidence-based medicine, and then there's the patient. So you need to look at the patient and hear what they're telling you. And that, I think, is one of the most fulfilling uh, things in in medicine and i think that's what pediatrics does the best um yeah. yes it's, there's so much is going on in the culture right now it's it's a tough tough times across the board yes but 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 again i i think that you can't have good quality medicine if you don't have the infrastructure to provide the the care that's, oh absolutely that's and absolutely so I, I think it's foolish for physicians I know this is a very bad analogy, but it's like me telling a woman I love her, and but we're going to sleep on the street because I can't afford to buy to rent an apartment. Mm -hmm. Love isn't enough. Me yeah. being a good doctor is not enough. Right. I, I need to have an exam room, a staff around me, and infrastructure and partners that help me provide the care I want to provide. Yeah. And if you sit, wash your hands of the other side, I don't think you can do a good job. No. But I think the doctors, the residents, the younglings, they all wash their hands of it. Or they're taught to wash their hands of it. Yes. And just go work for a system. We're going to take care of it. You're going to take care of it. I hope so. I'm trying. Yeah, no, no, I mean, that's what the system says. We're going to take care of it. We're going to take care of it. Oh, I thought you were asking me to take care of it. No, 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 no. 
No, no, that's what the system says. We'll take care of that. You don't worry about the real estate. You don't worry about the IT. You don't worry about hiring staff. You don't worry about this. And it creates a lot of dysfunction. It's the same dysfunction that I saw in the emergency room where the emergency room is contracted. The emergency room physicians are contracted out. The nurses are employed by the hospital. And anytime that you want to have a, a, a conversation of this nurse doesn't know what she's doing, you have to go through 10 people before someone listens to you. Yeah. I mean, the worst story I had is in, I, I sedated a kid to, uh, for a fracture that the orthopod wouldn't set his arm back in place. And I gave him atropine uh, before I gave him ketamine because that ketamine causes a lot of salivation. And a nurse that had been in the ER for like 30 years says to me, wow, I never knew atropine could sedate a kid. And I went to the nursing manager the very next day. I said, you need to get her off the floor. An ER nurse that doesn't know what atropine does after 30 years is a danger to your patients. Yeah. And she's like, well, there's a process. I'll counsel her. We'll talk to HR. You know, it took two <laughs> years. Before, it took two years before she actually was asked to retire. But to me, that's like a that's a no-brainer. If somebody's been in the ER for 30 years and they don't know what atropine does, yeah. they don't belong there anymore. Yeah. Right? Because that leads to bad outcomes. Yeah. But you yeah. can't do that in a system. No. It'll take you two or three yeah. years and yeah. they know it. They'll know that you'll get, as a physician, you'll get frustrated, leave before that nurse has to quit or yeah. that front desk person or that IT person that never answers your calls. You yeah. know, they know how to hide and game the system. And that's not the same in a private practice. Somebody pulls a stunt like that. They're gone the next day. Yeah. Right. Marjorie, right, how do you think? Go ahead. Let how me. do you think you solve the question or the problem of access to care or working later at night or on the weekends and on Sunday with, with the new younglings, the new, new generation? Because we interview physicians all the time. And the first question is, I don't want to work weekends. I don't want to work nights. And I don't <laughs> want to be on call or go to the hospital. <laughs> I mean, when did we become bankers? Yeah. Well, when we were, when we we had our, our group, because one of the things was all the partners did everything else everybody else did. It wasn't, yeah. well, I'm now doing this, I'm not. It was like, we all had skin in the game. Yeah. And that's how we presented it, that we're all doing the same thing. Nobody gets any any benefits here. But with again, well, with the with the system, what's interesting is again, you may want some things, but if you're getting pushback from those who are in the system and get maybe get complaints, then right. you get counseled. Wow. Well, we have to talk about blah blah blah, and we have to talk about or or you're basically um, um, you're not supported. Not maybe not you know vehemently, but definitely there's a signal there that uh, you can be you can be questioned, and when you try to discuss, well, this is important because this and this, it it sort of again that was the the frustration it fell on deaf ears, yeah. um, which was you know again it's it's like and you you know sometimes you know when you certain things in your life you look at it and go all right this is because it was funny because even with the administrator I worked very closely with for 30 years from our office would used to come and talk to me about stuff. And I was like, we're beating our heads against the wall uh, because we're not, we're not being listened to. So we're not being heard. And again, no malice, there was no malice. It's just, there were probably so many other priorities, but if you want to make the place run, and again, what does primary care need? Infrastructure, communication. Uh, but if you're not going to pay attention to that, it's like building a house without a um, foundation. foundation. 
So you build this house, you got this gorgeous thing, but you have nothing supporting it. So it starts, it starts crashing. It's that, it's that foundation that makes everything, you get that square. You, you, you probably have taken care of 90% of, of what you need to take care of. But if you're not, if you're not going to be listened to. Yeah. I'm not going to yeah. be right against the wall. So I take it that you guys were doing fairly okay as independent practice. Yes. And, and as the system took you guys over and got rid of the top level problem people, as they see it, <laughs> um, it didn't do so good anymore. Yeah, I can't, I don't, I can't, it was funny when we, when we joined the system, I was one of the only physicians, I would go to the finance meetings, I would go to this meeting, because I was like, I want to understand what the process is. And then as time went on, it was like, yeah, no, you really can't go to those meetings. Um, so it it's, um, again, you, and you know, you would hope that because you've got some, this, 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 this whole packet of, 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 of what you've gone through and, and your, and your problems, because I'm a pretty good problem. And it, you know, it's funny, it's like a lot of what we do for medicine and, and problem solving for our patients is it, you just take that and you, you switch it to, okay, what does the business need? What does this need? What does that need? And, and, it, you know, cause that's, I, I think that's what makes a, a, a doctor competent, you know, you, yeah. you figure thing. If this didn't work, I'm going to look at this. If that didn't work, we're going to figure that, figure this out. And same thing in, in a business thing. And, and, but again, it was just, just frustrating. Just you know that you have more of an MBA in your head than <laughs> a Harvard MBA graduate that just started to work at the system. <laughs> it's true. It's called yeah. common sense, common sense, critical thinking, and problem solving. That's that's what that's what that's what that's what business is. Yeah. And you think about what the priorities are, and from that, what the priorities are, you figure out how you're going to build it. And and you know, and and you keep the human touch. But here we are. I, I think critical thinking is not allowed anymore. No. No, it's not. I shouldn't have even said it. <laughs> yeah, critical, critical it's okay. thinking. We won't cancel you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> just no, eliminate but, the name I also said before. Just yeah. the... <laughs> but, but I, I don't think it's allowed. I, I don't. I think when you do critical thinking in, inside a big health system, they call you a disruptive physician. They want to show you the door. Yeah. I think that when you say, "I don't think this policy from this, this or that, makes any sense." like you know spending fifteen hundred dollars a month for the rest of the life of of a patient's life to control their weight uh i mean how we're gonna afford it right and then you're like they're like well herb is always a naysayer he's such a troublemaker how you yeah. know he's he's a, he's against the oh, institution yeah. he's against the institution yes. I, and i think i'm just asking a fair question you're asking me to give my patients a fifteen hundred dollar a month drug that has to be taken for life without knowing what side effects ha happen when you start them at 12 and they are on it till they're 60. And it's $1,500 a month. Yeah. I don't care if you're, if you're paying it out of pocket. I don't care if Medicaid's paying for it. We're all paying for it. Yeah. And can we afford it? Right. And is, uh, it, a, is it the best care? Is it the best care? Can we afford it? Can we get, can we really do that? And, and but you, oh, he, he's, he's a naysayer. He's against the institution. Oh yeah. Yes. I, I'm just asking, answer the question. Yes, 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 yes. yes Show yes. me the data, convince me. Yes. That's critical yeah. thinking. That's how I was trained. <laughs> Don't take anything for granted. If somebody tells you that patient's got pneumonia, go look at the x-ray yourself. Maybe it's not a pneumonia. Maybe it's a cancer. Yep. Yep. Go talk to the radiologist. Yep. Go go to the go to the to the lab and talk to the to the tech that looked at the smear to make sure it is pneumococcus. Yep. Does me people yeah, make mistakes? No, we don't do any of that. We don't do critical thinking. The the report says, okay, I sign off on it. That's where he says, I sign off on it. The culture says, I sign off on it. 
right? And whose fault is that? Ours. We allowed Absolutely. it to happen. We allowed Absolutely. it to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. We stopped, we stopped being professionals in doing the art of medicine, which was, as um, you mentioned, listen to the patient. Yep. That's where it starts. And yep. then don't stop thinking about the patient. Yep. You know, I go, I go home after clinic and I worry about this, this or that other kid because yep. I'm not sure what, that I have the right diagnosis. I'm not sure I give them the right dosage of the medication. I'm not sure who I should call. And, you know, I just worry about it and I, until I figure it out. Right. And, and that's, speaking about that, what, that's one of the beauties too in, in primary care because you can get on the phone in a day or two and say, listen, how we doing? Even even that touching base and and going from here to there, and if if it if it's not where it should be, you go okay. We're gonna we're gonna modify, right? Again, and that makes great medicine. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's what makes medicine such a wonderful thing. That somebody like George, you guys are trying to hold hold dear and continue, and that's yes. why I have so much respect. Yes, I I think that. When you can actually help a human being, there's never any greater joy. Yep. I mean, it's just a phenomenal feeling of, yep. hey, I helped this family. I, I might, I might not have the diagnosis right, but the kids doing better. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, and that's what's that's what matters. So that but matters. You care. You got to care. I don't know. You can teach people to care. You have to care. You have to be passionate. Yes. And we need, and again, hopefully, uh, again, you know, it's funny. You try to, I, you know, you throw your rock upon the bread. Was it the bread upon the water or the rock of bread upon the water? And that goes to here and that goes to there. Even if you can do it in your your circle, it's still it's still something. You can't not try. Right, right. How do you think the future of private practice? Um, will evolve in the next years, in the coming years. Will you say these that again? Are, how, how do you think, how do you see the future of private practice evolving in the in the next years? Is there a future for, for primary care in private practice? I think they're gonna be niches. And because I have to tell you, having the last, uh, I, I had re retired, but I actually continued to work elsewhere. Um, People are clamoring for it. They're, they are so desperate for the kind of care you get in a, in a small setting. So there's a need for it. The, and then the, I, we always found it's word of mouth. So if someone, again, I think at this point with the way this, the, the whole setup is, um, we have to try to do it from our own base and and god willing it it moves to other places but i think we're in for a tough time yeah you know i think the systems not the system the insurance carriers are starting to see that you know just dealing with systems it's not so good because the systems now have more power than they do and they yes. demand the insurance carrier yes you're going to do it like this otherwise we walk yeah and um, I think they're starting to realize that. Then when I negotiate with them, I said, look, you want us to stay viable. You know, we're not solo, solo. We're not huge, but we're big enough to matter. So you should support us. Yes. And I usually get what I want. Yeah. And I think the way you've approached things, George, with this are really j just incredible. Yeah. I have so much respect for you to, <laughs> besides doing your job, <laughs> doing that <laughs> yeah. she's talking about you know it's very you know it's a very sad narrative um i spoke to when we were developing our cin herb uh, we were just at the beginning of our clinically integrated network and i bumped in i called up you know i got all these guys together and i called up marjorie and i said you know if your group joins us man we'll be huge collectively and then they had their little issues and they joined the system and then I got, I, I knew that was the end of the conversation. So I said to Marjorie, you know, you know, maybe, maybe you should keep your CV up to date because one day, maybe in three, four years, you may be reaching out to me. <laughs> Guess what happened? 
<laughs> I did. Yeah. You know, but we're respecting her. She's coming. She's working when she wants to work. However, and she's like the best one we got. Yeah. I, mean, I, I was afraid with the computer technology that she's going to have an issue. So what do you do? Like what we did with Dr. Raymond, you would get her a scribe. She says, computers, I've already changed six. Your little computer system, there's no problem for me. Yeah. Like, wow, <laughs> she laughed at me. You figure out the tricks. Yeah. You cut to the chase and figure yeah. out what, again, how do you, because at the end of the day, it's like, what were you thinking about with the patient? What was your assessment? And what was your plan? That's it. What was the critical. critical? And then you can go to that and go, okay, I know what. So this is where we're going. Yeah. And very, again, structure, structure and, and what's, what's important. Yeah. But, but you also have a wonderful personality. You, yeah. You're contagious. Yes. And, 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 but she's also, she doesn't see problems. She sees resolutions to problems. Resol yes. Yeah. How do I solve that problem? It's like a challenge. Like, you know, like, yeah. you know, how do I solve that problem? She, it's just a challenge. It's something new to do. Yeah. Uh, yes which is something young people should emulate. Life is full of challenges. Yes. And it's not the challenge, it's how you rise up to the challenge that makes a difference, right? I tell um, my patients, you go, you know, you, you hit a wall, you, you, so you got to backpedal and you yeah. go another way. It's like yeah. even some of their brain, if they're anxiety, like how do you backpedal and go somewhere else with, but you know, you, you can either roll, curl up in, in a ball, or you decide you want to live and you want to, you want to continue to do. And if you've had it, if it's a gift, because this, this, this business has been a gift. It's a gift. Yes. You go for it. Yes. And then, you know, it, it's whatever it is. It is. <laughs> yeah. But I don't think we can be, I, I think pessimism doesn't uh, work. And I think again, being in the this practice or being in, in, in medicine is, you always have that ability to, to ded rededicate yourself to why you went into it. And yeah. I think that alone is, is a, it really is very, it, 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 it feeds your soul. Yes. So, but what, what advice would you give to doctors who are considering a career in private practice? I, I would tell them it's, it's, it can be one of the most uh, uh, fulfilling things it's a lot of work. You know, we don't go, we didn't go into pediatrics for money. And it's funny because it turned out it ended up fi being financially very, very solid. But, um, but it's, but it, again, I always tell them it's about the patient. You have to listen to the patient because, again, back to the, the, my preceptor, he said, they don't come in with the diagnosis. You have to figure it out. So it's that communication. And if, if that's what you're in it for, and you know, put these poor kids right now with the with the amount of, of um payment, their 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 loans and stuff. Their loans is it very money? it's very difficult. It's 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 um it, it's it's tough. So yeah. they're I know they're looking at that, but 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 I think at the end of the day, we need to be in this for the right reasons. Yeah. That's another sore point that I have with the payments and the student loans and things. Why can assist, you, we, we get these people, we had two physicians, one that interviewed in our office this past year. She was Dr. Raymond's patient. Dr. Raymond was her mentor. Yeah. He was on a, when she interviewed with us, I got him on a FaceTime to say hello. And he remembered everything about her. Yeah. He asked, so how's your, your father's car wash doing? Oh, he sold that a couple of years ago. Now they're retired. The guy remembered the whole family. I thought he was joking. I asked the doctor, is he, yeah. is he telling us something or is it real? She said, no, it is real. Um, she had a lot of loans. Um, so she ended up going to work at a system down the street. We had a patient that Dr. Riley and myself had seen when he was born. He grew up in our office. So that would be your next generation right there. Yeah. Did not take a job, went down the street to the system. We service the same population of Medicaid and Child Health Plus. Yeah. Why is that okay for them to get loan forgiveness, yet an independent practice cannot obtain loan forgiveness for these physicians? That's yeah. just not right. We service the same patients, better access. Yep. It just it's it blows my mind. So I challenge anybody to answer this to me from the you know the government point of view. Um they can't. Yeah. 
It's terrible. No, well, that's a little salt box. No, yeah. it's it's another part of the deck that's stacked. Yeah. Sure. I'll knock over that deck too one day. I know you will. I know you will. <laughs> the scary part is he will. Yeah. Yeah. He will. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been great uh chatting with you. Thanks for your time and everything you've done you've done for the kids of Long Island and the US through your career. And I hope to see you soon again. Yeah, well, I'm joining him in a couple of weeks. So. Yeah. <laughs> she's gonna be she's gonna be one of our stars. That's awesome. Yeah, I think it's going to be. I, actually, I, I, I've said even if I, I'm 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 ready to go increase hours because I I really missed the, the whole thing. I mean, I've been doing it, but I missed the whole thing. But yes, this is you know next next uh, next uh, part of life. Yes. All right. Wonderful. And it's five minutes from my house. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank all you. right. Thank, Thank you, you so all. much. All right. Take care. You too. Thank you for listening. This has been a production of the Pediatric Lounge. On the show notes, you will find links to our co-host and other important notes as well as a timetable of the topics discussed today. Don't forget to follow us on social media and subscribe to wherever you listen to your podcast. Leave us a great review as it helps us greatly. In the meantime, we will see you next week. The Pediatric Lounge. The conversations are not intended as medical advice and the opinions expressed are solely those of the host and the guest.